Visitors to the White House come in here to the fish room. It got its name because President Roosevelt used to keep some guppies in here. Reporting from Washington in the 1960s gave Knowlton Nash a front seat to many historical moments, from the Cuban Missile Crisis to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. But it also gave Knowlton unprecedented access to a fabled American political family. Tonight, Adrian Arsenault enters our archives to look at who Knowlton knew and found the lesser known private connections of a public broadcasting legend. These last few days have been a bit like climbing into your grandparents' attic and blowing the dust off the treasures to get a sense of your family's story. But then floating political traditions is nothing new for the Kennedys. Characters and celluloid, and a story that is Canada's, journalism's, and Knowlton Nash's. Half a century ago, among the standout scenes of so much smoking on camera and the sense that only men could interpret the world then is a recurring theme the Kennedy connection. Flying around the South with Kennedy and watching him in New York, you see a kind of electric quality in his appearances before the crowds. They cheer louder and longer than do the Nixon crowds, and Kennedy himself seems almost to believe his line that he is a new Roosevelt. From JFK as senator to president. Nobody can generate the kind of excitement that he does. And yet From Bobby Kennedy as senator and would be kind of president. Into a vote. The lives and deaths of both icons followed by Nash as a journalist with the sort of access everyone else envies. Yes, that's Nash appearing to land on the White House lawn. I'm Knowlton Nash. The President of the United States has the most impossible job in the world. Visitors to the White House come in here to the fish room. It got its name because President Roosevelt used to keep some guppies in here. The fish room is one thing, but look what else we found. This is the most important chair in the world. The man who sits here could destroy the world by simply pushing a button. What he does in this chair, at this desk, can mean war or peace, can mean boom or bust for the world economy, for the Canadian economy. What he does affects in one way or another every human being from St. John's to Victoria, from Tokyo to Cairo. Reporting from the Oval Office as nonplussed as ever, just another day at work, as if it's no big deal. Was this to him? That's a souvenir cigarette case, a gift to Nash from John F. Kennedy to mark the time he spent on the presidential campaign plane, named the Caroline after Kennedy's daughter. That they were close gets clear in the footage and in Nash's book. In here, he tells a story of Kennedy being bizarrely interested in Nash's job, constantly asking him what he made. Money seems a common theme. He writes that the president once needed magazines, and so he sent an aide out to get them, but realized he didn't have any cash, so he turned to the assembled reporters. I muttered that I had five bucks, wrote Nash. Fine, the president said, sticking out his hand. That'll do. Nash said he never got his five bucks back. And consider this. That is Nash with Pierre Salinger, Kennedy's White House press secretary. The man Nash witnessed play with the thermostat and crank up the heat in the studio the night of the infamous Kennedy-Nixon debate, the first ever television debate. Have you ever wondered why Nixon was sweating so? Considering that Knowlton Nash was not even an American reporter, the president and Salinger certainly seemed to have time for him. As one story goes, Kennedy once told Salinger he was getting a little heavy and suggested he exercise. So Pierre Salinger started running, invited some pals to join him in the mornings. Knowlton Nash was among them. That is apparently what started his lifelong love affair with jogging. Hard to get closer to the circles of power than that. And almost 20 years ago, Nash sat down to talk of that, of the rarity of that connection between reporter and politician. There was a greater intimacy and there was more private time that you had than you do now. You, you'd go out to the house and Jack Kennedy lived in Georgetown or Bob Kennedy lived in Hickory Hill just across the river in Virginia. Uh, and then just gossip about the events of the day or anything at all. Uh, you can't do that today. 
If Nash had to choose a favorite Kennedy, it seems it would have been Bobby. He followed him as a young senator, watched him up close on the campaign trail. It's interesting to note, however, that at this stage of the campaign, he remains more popular than his brother John was in the 1960 presidential election campaign at this same stage. If you thought President Barack Obama created a buzz and sense of celebrity when he ran for office, then apparently you've never really stared at the old footage of Bobby Kennedy on the hustings. He's been pulled off countless cars by his wildly emotional fans. He's had his shoes yanked off, lost dozens of cufflinks, had his coat ripped, and someone once tried to pull off his socks. Through it all, though, he smiles bravely, but a little warily. Nash would know the wary smile. He'd seen it up close, been given frequent one-on-one -on -one access to the candidate. How do you rate the issue as against the individual? Uh, which draws the crowds, you as a personality or the issues you support? I think that's hard to tell. People are concerned about Vietnam. They're concerned about the violence. Many of our population who are deprived are concerned about the injustices that still exist. So I think it depends on the kind of community or where you visit. Uh, some people are just terribly desperate about the situation that affects their lives. Others are just seeing your picture on the cover of magazines, and so it's a lark of one kind or another. They had an easy way together because they'd worked alongside each other for years. Nash reporting on Kennedy when, as a young senator, he was trying to take on the unions and organized crime. It meant working late into the night, grabbing a ride home with friends or Bobby Kennedy. I remember once when Bob was driving us home, and uh, we were just driving out of the Senate office building, down the hill, and past the Teamsters building, and up in the top floor of the Teamsters building were the offices of Jimmy Hoffa, the president, who was under investigation by Bob and the committee. And the lights were all blazing up there. And I remember Bob looked up at those lights and said, if that son of a bitch is still working, I've got to go back to work too. And he wheeled the car around, went back to the work, and we had to get a cab to go home. <laughs> Letting reporters in on their private thoughts, there was a trust there. That was the era's gift that's hard to relate to now. Hard to relate as well to the era's ugliness. Reporting on the lies of the Kennedys meant reporting on their assassinations too. White House correspondents in 1963 were so stunned in grief that they were allowed to march in the funeral procession as the last contingent Nash was among them. In reflection, in writing, he seemed so angry with himself for his coverage. Good reporters are supposed to be objective, he wrote. To do otherwise is to color factual reporting with personal feelings. On this noon hour, I failed to meet that criteria. Then came Bobby Kennedy's assassination in 1968. After Kennedy's death a few years later, you began to really, really uh, let your emotions overwhelm you, at least I did. Bob would have been a great president. Then you wonder how the world would have changed if those ifs had come about. He was so hard on himself in all he wrote and said of that time, always wondering what would happen next, what would have been, could have been. It's what kept Knowlton Nash thinking and writing long after he finished reporting. Like so many of the men he covered, he had more to say, more to contribute, when time came calling. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Toronto.